Does your city have a bike network? Does it offer safety or convenience? Or does it require vehicular cycling? Who uses it and how often do people use it? When city leaders talk about people on bikes, who are they referring to? In the US, one in three people can't drive. Personally, as a person with low vision, I've been using a bike as a means of transportation since I was a teenager. I've used it to get to work or even as work to take my kid to school, to pick up medicine from the pharmacy, or just to simply experience the world around me. I've cycled by myself, with family, with friends, in groups of strangers. I've experienced cycling culture in Seattle and its suburbs, San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, Portland, Vancouver, Montreal, Paris, Amsterdam, Angers, rural Washington State, rural France, Tokyo, and Nantes. In each one of these places, the cycling culture was different. In one, you may find people riding for sport. In another, you may find that it's folks who can't afford a car. In another, it may be parents taking their kids to school. And in another, it may just be everyone. Why such difference? Is it just preference? Is it a difference in the level of investment in infrastructure? Is it population density? Or is it people just choosing the most easy way of getting around? It's likely a combination of those things. But in my opinion, the common denominator is municipal investment and how the people making those investments perceive cycling. Your city may invest a lot or a little in cycling or somewhere in between. They could dedicate that funding toward mixed use paths, upgraded intersections, cyclist or driver education programs, little orange flags or flashing lights, protected bike lanes, paint, signs, community engagement, or again, maybe some combination of all these things. But how they feel about cycling is likely the greatest determinant of how those dollars are spent. Take Seattle, for instance. We've got about 3,500 lane miles of roadway, but only about 5% of that is dedicated to any type of bike infrastructure. It's rarely connected, it disappears randomly, and it's often as simple as putting down a sharrow, putting up a sign, or creating wayfinding for people on bikes without giving any sense to drivers that they're in a shared space. But who uses bikes in Seattle? Well, everyone. Despite that, leaders are reluctant to make investments in safety improvements that would bring people out who currently say that they don't cycle because of safety. When we invest like this, we overlook the needs of people with disabilities, low-income people, unhoused people, children and their parents, and elders. All people who rely on a bicycle as transportation but are forced to rely on networks built for young, athletic people who use a bike for recreation. In places experiencing a boom in cycling, it's not recreational cyclists that are leading the surge though. It's elders or kids, like in the case of Angers, it's parents, women, and it's workers, like in Nantes or Paris, Montreal, Amsterdam, or Tokyo. But why? Investments in safety, education, and accessibility, and in normalization of cycling for mobility. These cities are making it easier for people to choose a method of transportation that, according to almost any survey you can find, people want to use. In these places, bikes aren't just seen as tools for sport, for daredevils, for young people, or for poor people, for rich people, for people without kids, or for irresponsible parents. All of those excuses you hear. Instead, in these places, bikes are for everyone. And once our investments match that idea, the effects spill over into other aspects of public life. People with disabilities, even those who can't easily use a traditional bike, have more safe options for mobility. Kids and elders have more opportunity for autonomy and social connection. 
women and non-binary people have more control of public space. Low-income people don't have to put themselves at risk to go to work or even to perform their work. Noise pollution and, hell, pollution pollution diminishes. Public space can be granted back to truly public use for leisure, for connection, or for play. There are so many benefits to an equitable system of mobility, one that sees public transportation, personal automobiles, and, yep, bikes as equal options for mobility. Places that embrace the idea that the bike isn't for someone else, but rather for everyone, benefit in so many ways. So if you find yourself advocating for bike infrastructure where you live, keep these things in mind. After all, seeing cycling simply as a recreation or a sport is just as dumb as equating driving a car with Formula One or NASCAR. And our leaders need to hear that reminder constantly. A community that advocates for community benefit can build a city that works better for everyone in a multitude of ways. But it takes will from elected leaders, from transportation agencies, and from people addicted to driving. That's a tall order, but it's not impossible. It takes strong advocacy, especially advocacy centered on people who use cycling for mobility because they can't drive. If you can't drive, let people know. Again, one out of three people in the U.S. can't, yet we stigmatize the idea from so many different angles. We can remind our leaders, our neighbors, and our friends that there's no such thing as bike people just like there's no such thing as car people. And that relegating people who can't drive to just 5% of the city is downright shitty. There's work ahead of us in places like Seattle in order to achieve equitable mobility, but others have come before us and shown us the game plan. We just have to follow it. <laughs>